Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm looking at Elizabeth I's foreign policy in between 1568 and 1588. There's already a video um, covering the earlier period and I will go on and, I'll, uh, and look at the Armada and the war with Spain in more detail in further videos. This video is will concentrate on proposal plots and this movement towards the outbreak of war with Spain. Looking at the um, the specification in terms of what it tells us to do, so this is aimed at A-level history, in particular the AQA Unit 1C, which is a really uh, popular uh, unit of A-level history. Uh, and the key question on all of that is how did relations with foreign powers change and how was the succession secured? And so we're going to look at some key elements of that in this. And in particular, it tells us the bullet point on Elizabeth on foreign policy says issues of succession, which are obviously massive because of the fact uh, she never marries and marriage continues to be uh, an issue going into this time period. We've got Mary, Queen of Scots, who I'm going to look at in a bit of detail, her, her time in England, which is, is of course, massively important and, and linking with that idea of succession because uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, is a potential uh, successor to Elizabeth uh, and a potential rival as well. Uh, and relations with Spain. And we're going to look at relations with Spain. I'll also look a bit in terms of relations with Scotland and relations uh, with France. And it all kind of it interlinks. So this should give us a, a kind of a a good overview and some good insight into this really key part of Elizabeth's policy. Like one of the favourite areas of, of questions on foreign policy is is the causation and, and the reasons um, for for the war with Spain. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that I look at in this video will help help answer any questions on that. So to start off with, then we need to think about what is Elizabeth trying to do? So it, it, what is the foundation of her foreign policy? And this is particularly useful if you then ask to look at things like um, the degree of success in her foreign policy. Because to do that, you need some criteria and those criteria are going to be based on what, well, what is she actually trying to achieve? And therefore, ultimately, does she, try, does she manage to achieve those? Essentially, Elizabeth's foreign policy is largely defensive. Uh, what she wants to do is she wants to avoid attack or, or war with one of the two major powers um, that are on her doorstep, which are France and Spain, and Spain part of uh, the, the wider kind of Habsburg Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. So she she wants to stay on as good terms with those as she possibly can. Now, it's difficult because they are often at loggerheads with each other. So if she moves closer to one, then she puts herself uh, further away from the other. And we will see some stuff that she does in terms of marriage negotiation, where she kind of seems to jump from one to the other. How genuine a lot of those marriage negotiations ever are is up for question. Um, now, we see her wanting to prevent either of those stronger European nations dominating the Netherlands. Now, the, the Netherlands are kind of quasi kind of semi-autonomous region, kind of connected to, to the Habsburg Empire. Um, they were the key area for, for uh, English trade, particularly the wool trade. They are, are of huge strategic importance because um, sea border going over to, to the English East Coast. And they're important for religious reasons as well. The, the, it's, it's in the Netherlands that there is, is a large group of, of Protestants. And again, supporting foreign Protestants is another potential motivator in Elizabeth's foreign policy. And often we see that particularly the likes of, um, of Leicester and Cecil pushing Elizabeth to do more to support foreign Protestants. Uh, Elizabeth often seems a bit more reticent um, and it, it, it runs huge dangers. So you help the Huguenots in France, then you, you anger the French Catholics and you put yourself at risk from that. If you, you uh, help the Dutch Protestants uh, and their, their actions against the Spanish, then you anger the Spanish and make war with Spain more likely. So there's a balancing act and those ones all interlink, the avoiding war, the preventing dominance of the, of the Netherlands and, and supporting foreign Protestants. Uh, there, there is, as I've already mentioned, this idea of seeking marriage alliance and, and this remains a diplomatic tool. I, again, there are questions of how genuine um, some of these marriage negotiations are, though there is one which is actually accepted, which is the, the one with Anjou. I mean, one of the things to bear in mind is, is that Elizabeth is 35 in 68 and therefore she's 55 in 88. Now, and this goes back to the old double standards. If she was a king, then marriage negotiations in your 30s, 40s and 50s, not a massive problem. 
as a queen, um, then this can be looked at as very different. And we see again with the, the uh, negotiations with Anjou in the late 70s, they suddenly this huge fear of uh, amongst some of her council that if she does go ahead with it, what risk of childbirth, what risk of, of Anjou ending up putting himself on the throne if she died. So the, if she died in childbirth in particular. And there's also this idea of promoting trade and exploration. And, and again, in that she will clash with Spain because um, Spain has laid claim to, to the new world. So lots of lots of key things that she's trying to do. And some of those try tend to conflict with each other. Now, named on the spec is Mary, Queen of Scots. So she is obviously a very, very key uh, figure. And she's massively important in the uh, in, in the story of Elizabeth and in, and in this bit of history. Uh, and we will see there's a whole range of plots that uh, centre around her. There's a rebellion that centre around her. Now, she's arrived in England in, in 68 uh, and she, she fled from Scotland where she'd been overthrown. Uh, and there were the, was the casket letters that implicated Mary in the, the murder of her husband, uh, Lord Darnley, her second husband. And so she comes in under, well, a huge cloud uh, and she's kept prisoner in various locations in Northern England. You go and visit kind of old houses and, and, and castles and stuff in Northern England. Then they'll tell you that they had Mary, Queen of Scots at some point. And she she was um, kept in, in, in fairly good, fairly kind of luxurious surroundings. But she was, in, in essence, a, a, a prisoner. Now, she poses a, a huge problem um, for for Elizabeth. Now, the two of them never met, so don't ignore things you might see in, in slightly shoddy films. Um, so they never meet. Now, Mary, on one hand, is Elizabeth's cousin, uh, and she is a fellow female ruler in, in, a, in a world where that is um, it's hugely uh, unusual and difficult. And so there is in that way a kind of affinity between uh, Elizabeth uh, and Mary. But also she's a potential um, rival to Elizabeth's throne and she is very much going to be the focus of Catholic discontent in England. So Mary is someone who Elizabeth might have a feeling, feelings, feelings of positive feelings or feelings of affinity towards, but is also someone who is a potential threat. Now, this is highlighted in 1569 when the Northern Rebellion takes place uh, and the plan behind that was um, to free Mary, marry her to the Duke of Norfolk, invade Scotland and then their kids would be uh, them or their kids would, would be the natural heirs to the English throne as well. Um, and now this is seen as a direct attempt to, to take the throne from Elizabeth by Elizabeth and her council and the Norfolk backs out, uh, the Northern Rebellion is defeated, uh, Elizabeth is completely ruthless in her, her in her crushing of it. Now Norfolk and Mary both survive this which went against the advice of some of Elizabeth's advisors. In 71, you then get the Ridolfi plot. Now, the Ridolfi plot was centred around a Ridolfi, an Italian banker. He's part involved the Spanish landing and, and, and supporting put, putting Mary, Queen of Scots and Norfolk on the English throne. Uh, there was, it was never actually 100% clear that there genuinely was um, Spanish support behind this, but Elizabeth had been excommunicated the year before. There was some big implications, some, some big ramifications from this. It, it did lead to uh, the execution of Norfolk, who was the closest male, rel male relative to Elizabeth. But it didn't, the, again, despite the advice of some of the councillors, lead to the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. And the plots then just keep coming. So in, in 83, 84, there is the Throckmorton um, plot. This corresponded with a time where there was lots of Catholic missionaries coming into England and trying to to, to read, lead a kind of counter-reformation and spread uh, spread Catholic ideas and undermine Elizabeth's rule. Uh, and it involved some various plans for invasion, the Throckmorton plan. So the, the, there was a, the idea that the Spanish would invade Lancashire, which is, again, a strong a stronghold for Catholicism. But again, the, there's not much evidence to back that up as a, a genuine possibility. More likely uh, was part of the plot, which was for the Duke of Guise, who was Mary's cousin to land in Sussex. Uh, and then there are various historians, uh, far more knowledgeable than I am, who have looked at this in a lot of detail. So the likes of Bossy, who believe that this was a, a real genuine threat. 
The, the plot was broken by a, a, an agent of Walsingham, Elizabeth's spy master, uh, who had a spy in the, the French embassy. And this led to the expulsion of Mendoza, who was the Spanish ambassador, uh, and the creation of uh, the Bond of Association, which was a, a bond, an oath that was taken by... Um, by members of the the gentry and nobility and key lots of key figures across England who who swore that they would uh, they would fight and die to defend uh, Elizabeth against her her enemies. It, it, obviously, this the idea of this was to eradicate all these plots. It doesn't work completely. In in eighty five, we have the the Parry plot again. This aim to assassinate Elizabeth and replace her with Mary. Now, there's there's lots of kind of I don't know, kind of 16th century James Bond in all of this. It, it's unclear whether Parry was a double agent or maybe even a triple agent. Um, so he had been employed to spy on the Catholics by Elizabeth's government. Um, whether he'd then been turned by the Catholics, whether he would pretended to be turned by the Catholics to, to pull this plot out, whether again it leads to his his execution whether this was just because simply he knew too much about what was going on or because this was a genuine plot it's not a hundred percent clear the next plot is, is is i think probably the most famous of them because it, it it leads to the execution of mary queen of scots and that's the babington plot it took it took place in the backdrop of, of growing tension and English intervention in the Netherlands. So so war with Spain is looking uh, well. It, I, some would argue war with Spain has already started uh, at this point uh, with uh, fighting in the Netherlands. Uh, and what we see here is messages being passed to to Mary in what was known as the barrel post. I mean, post. So in barrels of a uh, uh, beer coming in, um, the there was like a, 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 a sealed tube. Uh, in the top of the barrel, which had these coded messages in it, and they would come in and out of the, where of where Mary was being held. Uh, as as this was happening, um, Cecil uh, uh, had complete control and knowledge of what was going on. The the um, the messages were being intercepted. The code was broken, so they were being read, and then they were being put back in the barrels and and let to go. And, and essentially, this was left left to happen until. They had the their key evidence to um, to put uh, Mary on trial and lead to her execution, um, and and that was done because there was a letter in which Mary consented to the assassination of Elizabeth, uh, and that was to, enough to to lead to her trial and then her execution. Um, so Mary fights her, her cause very evidently. She states that the the court had no ju uh, jurisdiction to try her because. Uh, she was a, a monarch, and these were the, the 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 only person she was potentially answerable to at all was Elizabeth, and Elizabeth wasn't there. She said all the letters were forgeries, and, and they denied that it was her signature or, or that had been her giving consent. But again, it was a fairly f foregone conclusion, despite the the incredibly brave face Mary put on, that that she was convicted. There's then this huge delay, so a four month delay until her execution. Elizabeth seemed absolutely torn. She did, didn't want to execute uh, this fellow monarch. Again, it doesn't set a very good uh, example as a monarch, does it? If, if a, a group of noblemen can put a, a, a queen on trial and find her guilty and then lead to her execution. Probably a precedent that Elizabeth didn't want to set. She did at one point uh, sign a warren. Uh, Davison then sealed the warren and took it and, and the execution was carried out. Uh, Elizabeth was furious when she found out uh, that Mary had been executed, so saying it wasn't what she wanted to happen. Um, all of this might be a great big display. Uh, it, might, it might be genuine emotion. It might be how she felt. She might have genuinely been torn on this. It might have been that she wanted to essentially wash her hands of it so she could blame the um, the court who had convicted and then her underlings who'd carried out the warrant without her without her wishes. And therefore, she didn't have the blood of Mary on her hands. They were on the, the hands of others. So again, that an area where there's much kind of historical debate on that one. Obviously, all this stuff with Mary, Queen of Scots affects him, it impacts on relations with Scotland. And this is always a lot smoother than you would potentially think it is, having looked at, at what happened with Mary, Queen of Scots. 
So the Protestant lords expelled Mary in 68, and the Protestant lords and the English generally got on reasonably well. Um, the uh, the new king of Scotland is James VI, who, who was Mary's son. Uh, again, very, very young uh, when all this happens. Uh, it, and then Scotland essentially has its own issues, really, at this point in time, with, with its own reformation and, and conflict between Protestants and Catholics in Scotland. Uh, we then kind of go forward to, to 1586 and we see the Treaty of Berwick, which promotes peace, harmony and a defensive league with England and also a, a pension for James. And then a year later, Elizabeth executes James's mum. A year after that, James assures Elizabeth his support as she faces the uh, Armada. Now, going a bit beyond the kind of time frame of this video, but just to kind of spell out where, where this goes on. So it seems odd there isn't more of a reaction to from, from James, particularly as he gets older with his mum being first of all held prisoner in the neighbouring uh, country and then executed, where his eyes are on the prize of the English throne. Uh, he marries Anne of Denmark in 89. They have uh, multiple children, three of whom um, survive into, into adulthood. From 1601, he was in close correspondence with Robert Cecil, the Elizabeth chief minister. In 1603, he becomes James I of England. So in terms of succession, the, uh, Mary for a lot of time well up until her execution in 87 was seen as the the the, clo the closest blood relative the person who was had the strongest claim to the throne after elizabeth so if elizabeth had died before mary was executed then it seemed that would be the next person in line to the throne once um mary has been uh, been executed then it becomes clear that the next in line would be james and james does whatever he can to position himself so he's on good terms um, with the, the English court, should that opportunity for him to become the English king, king should come around. And so that's why that bit runs off that and why there isn't a massive war with Scotland when the Scottish Queen is executed. Because remember, the Scots have thrown that Mary Queen of Scots out uh, following um, the, the murder of Darnley uh, and a, 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 a war, a, a series of battles between her and the Lords. Relations with, with France, so this is an area I think is, is really fascinating, but it did not often um, the, the, the absolute focus on it. I remember the specification mentions Spain, but to, to understand relations with Spain, you have to understand relations with France, because essentially if Elizabeth is on good terms with one, she's on bad terms with the other and, and vice versa. Now, earlier on, again, we talked about in terms of one of the motives of her foreign policy was to support um, foreign Protestants. Well, we, we, we saw her supporting Huguenots in 1562 to 1564, um, and, but this proved to be to, to hugely unsuccessful and, and leads to the, the, the Treaty of Troyes, uh, uh, which um, was not a good treaty for the English. Now we see relations improve again, kind of 68 to 70, we, we see marriage negotiations with Henri, Duke of Anjou, uh, not to be confused with the later Duke of Anjou, um, and he was heir to the French throne. Uh, and this was all taking place at the time where Elizabeth had seized some Spanish treasure ships. And so it looked like kind of a, a, an English-French alliance against the Spanish Habsburg Empire uh, would probably be a, a good bet for Elizabeth. Uh, and we, we see this. The marriage doesn't happen, but in 72, we, we see the, the Treaty of Bois, uh, a defensive league against Spain, and um, in that, the French said that they wouldn't support Mary, Queen of Scots, claim to the English throne, because I'm going back to the old alliance, and Mary had spent um, most of her, her formative years in in France and had been um, uh, had been married to uh, the, the French Dauphin. So that looks like relations are getting better with France in a case, as you'd expect, probably deter deteriorating with Spain at this time because we've got all the stuff going on with all the plots and all of that. The problem in 72 is, is in April, everything looks like it's pretty good. But then in August, you get the St. Bartholomew's massacre in France. And this is a massacre of French Protestants, the Huguenots. And this really damages uh, relations with England because it's very difficult for Elizabeth, as, as the, 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 the supposedly the, the leading Protestant monarch, to be on close terms with a country which has just massacred Protestants. Um, 
there were demands or, or calls for her to act more strongly and defend the the Huguenots but part of the the things she said the fingers burned back in in the 1560s and part of it was, was she was in, in in no position to do anything particularly with the the threat from Spain and all the plots and all the difficulties she'd having which has been the rebellion so England's response to this was, was fairly tame then we have the, the 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 well the closest Elizabeth ever gets to getting married I mean that she actually accepted this proposal so we've then got Francis who's now the Duke of Anjou who is is the younger brother of Hon, uh, of Henri uh, now Elizabeth called her him her little frog um she actually agreed to marry him they they, they they, they seem to be in love. It depends on what sources you look at, but there, there is at least the appearance of it because there are a series of love letters written between them. Now, this is part of the way diplomacy works at that point in time, and, and, and the real motivations behind these these things are maybe um, slightly more political and slightly um, less romantic. But we, um, we do see um a, a movement towards a marriage now francis um was known to to be small he had his he had some very strong um smallpox scars um and he was 20 years younger than elizabeth um originally the the marriage had support within the council but eventually the council ends up completely divided and, and in fact elizabeth says she can't move forward because of those divisions um the fear was the risk of childbirth for elizabeth given her age um so she's a she's what uh, she's 45 to 48 at this time um uh, and they they were also worried about Anjou's character what what was he up to what was he after uh there was various kind of wild accusations about parts of Anjou's personal life as well um there was uh, there was also a lot of anti-french feeling within england uh, there were some pamphlets and stuff produced attacking uh, attacking Anjou uh, and in the end rather than getting a marriage Anjou was uh, was given money by Elizabeth to fund a military campaign in the Netherlands and therefore suddenly the politics comes leaping out again and goes back to this stuff with the relationship with um with uh with Spain and, and Elizabeth's primary one of her primary goals be to prevent the dominance of either Spain or France in the Netherlands so she's going to fund the French essentially to fight the Spanish in the Netherlands. He actually then tries to claim the Netherlands for himself, but he is driven out, uh, and, and then he he dies in 1581. <clears throat> now, and the next kind of step with this, so whilst there's this kind of balancing act of power between France and Spain, then this is something Elizabeth can use. Um, we then see the Treaty of Jeanville. Uh, now, now the Huguenot Henry is, is, uh, of Navarre is, is the next in line to the French throne, but we see then see a, the French Catholic League signing a treaty, Treaty of Jeanville, with the Spanish. So, and that Catholic League it, it includes the Guise family. Um, that's the Guise family who are uh, related to Mary, Queen of Scots. So the Treaty of Jeanville is is really bad news for Elizabeth, and, and it looks like we might end up with. France and Spain getting on, and France and Spain getting on potentially is the worst possible news for Elizabeth. So moving on to um, relations with Spain, so th there is a lot of key issues to think about in this. Now, the, just before the time period we're looking at, the, there was a potential marriage um, uh, with Charles, uh, Charles of Austria, son of Charles uh, uh, V. Uh, uh, it's a potential marriage match for Elizabeth. He wasn't very keen on it. It doesn't doesn't happen. Uh, and then once that marriage arrangement goes away and she's then worried that she's drifting away in terms of relationship with Spain, then we start seeing those potential French matches. So we can see those the, the, the diplomatic game in all of this. Now, religion it is a key part in this. So Philip had stood against Elizabeth being excommunicated, um, despite obviously she was quite clearly a heretic. Um, was marriage to either first of all himself or uh, or Charles of Austria were, was a possibility. Now religion is the reason given for the Armada in in eighty eight, but 
Notably, he waited until after the key Catholic claimant to the English throne was dead, which might suggest that it's got more to do with him wanting the English throne for himself. A lot of stuff to do with um, relations with Spain is to do with the new world and trade and, and piracy by the English, or privateers as, as, as they're called, to try and make it sound um, slightly less uh, like they're just ships that go around attacking other ships and nicking the stuff on them, uh, which is essentially what um, a lot of the time Drake and Hawkins and the other English privateers did. So the Spanish saw them as pirates. Um, most importantly in all of this is um, the, the Netherlands. So uh, Eng the English wanted to stop the Spanish dominating the, uh, this area because it was the most important area for English trade because it was a Protestant heartland and again because of that strategic position of the Netherlands bordering uh, kind of the sea and then across to the east coast of England. So concentrating on, on the Netherlands, so this was a significant challenge to Elizabeth. So, so how much support could she give to the Protestant rebels fighting against the Spanish? Well, she, she wanted to, to maintain the Netherlands autonomy. She, she feared French dominance as well as Spanish. Um, and, and there's lots of interpretations about her actions and what she does and how successful it was, how consistent it was. Now, she largely reacts to events, trying to make the best of whatever opportunities present. I, I, I generally see Elizabeth as an opportunist, when it, particularly when it comes to um, it comes to foreign policy. Now, that can be seen as, as being slightly critical, that, that she doesn't seem to have an overall plan and she's just reactionary. She just reacts to what happens around her. But one of the important things to remember about this it is England is not the major power at this point in time. It, it's not in a position where it could could uh, easily take on the Spanish or the French. Um, and so actually that that kind of policy might be the best bet that she's got. She can't, you could say, well, she could have been more consistent and she could have more strongly done this and more defin definitively done that. Well, she, but that would that have caused war earlier when England was less well prepared? Um, and could that have led to, to, uh, to greater problems? So there's a whole range of different kind of questions or, 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 or debates that you could look at on this. So how successful were Elizabeth's policies? Again, going back to the aims we looked at earlier, does she manage to achieve those? Um, actually, is the war with Spain, which is going to come, is that England's fault? Did England provoke that war or is this just down to kind of um, uh, Spanish ambition and Spanish colonialism? Uh, and how consistent was Elizabeth's approach? And again, and because you've got this kind of change in continuity stem that we use in A-level history essays. And so does, does her policy change at a given point or is there is it consistent going through? If it changes, is that a problem or is that is that just sensible? Is this just good? Elizabeth is a, a good, clever politician understanding the world around her. Relations with Spain then are, are, are the absolute key bit. I'm going to go through kind of various time periods. There's lots and lots of stuff in all of this. So starting in 68, we, we've had this pavement of four, uh, payment of 400,000 uh, florins uh, that's been sent to the Duke of Alba's army. And that was kind of um, nicked by English. It, was, it, it, was, it landed in English port they, and Elizabeth decided, oh, I'll impound that. And rather than that money going to the Duke of Alba, I will take this as a loan. Um, I will take this loan on. Um, Alba responded um, by uh, confiscating all English ships that were in the Netherlands. Um, then this led to Elizabeth banning all trade with the Netherlands and Spain, and, and that ban was not fully overturned or fully, trade wasn't fully restored until 73. Now, this is very, very damaging to the English wool trade. So this is one where Elizabeth seems to just take a big gamble. Uh, and the consequences of it uh, we're pretty bad, actually, but it, it, but they, it doesn't lead to war. So again, it, what was this a, a well-placed gamble? As I mentioned earlier, we, we've got the English pirates and, and um, uh, various bits going going on. I mean, we, we've got Hawkins, who is disrupting uh, the Spanish trading monopoly in the Caribbean. He, he blockaded uh, the, the Mexican port of San, San Juan de Ula. Uh, only two ships managed to escape from that blockade, and th this really badly uh, affected relations. I mean, there's also um, the bit where where Elizabeth um, knights uh, 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 Sir Francis Drake on the 
<clears throat> on the uh, Golden Hind, and, and again, as he's seen as he's seen again as a pirate by the uh, by the Spanish, and so uh, this is seen as it's been highly provocative. So Elizabeth and her relationship with her adventurers, her traders, her pirates it, it is something, and their disruption of what was going on in the New World and, and attacking Spanish tra treasure ships in particular um, was something that caused a great deal of tension. Um, in 68 also Philip expelled the English ambassador from Madrid um, and re re and also replaced the Spanish ambassador of England uh, with, uh, with uh, Despairs. Uh, he was a hardline Catholic. He's immediately in contact uh, with Mary, Queen of Scots. And so there's always this shadow of Spanish involvement in the plots uh, and the rebellion against Elizabeth from this point forward. Uh, and that would maybe suggest that the fault for the war maybe lies with the Spanish who are, who are trying to undermine Elizabeth. And therefore, maybe Elizabeth's actions against the Spanish are justified. Again, there's a judgment call to make on all of that. And there is evidence to suggest that Philip was encouraging of the, the Northern Rebellion uh, in 1569 in and 1570. Elizabeth is excommunicated by Pope Pius V. Uh, this was something that, that Philip had argued against earlier and prevented. Well, you can see why in around 66, 67, when there's the potential marriage uh, to Charles of Austria. So he's not going to want Elizabeth to be excommunicated then. But now when... She seems to be moving towards the French and moving away from the Spanish. And we've we, we've had the various falling outs over shipping and and the stealing of the of, of this payment. Then we can see why um, Philip might become more anti English. How much Elizabeth to blame for that again is debated. Then, as we've already talked about, we've seen the Ridolfi plot. Well, Philip and the were were implicated in that plot. The the De, De was expelled. Uh, in six in 72 uh, Elizabeth expelled the uh, the Dutch sea be beggars from English ports and they then went and caused um, havoc uh, for the Spanish um, and they, they were licensed by William of Orange and a, a, a keep the key Protestant leader in, in the Netherlands and so again that damaged relationship uh, relationships with the uh, with the Spanish. Uh, a few years later, 75-76, uh, the Spanish army are imposing control over the Netherlands and they're committing atrocities. And, and the, the, this includes uh, this was not referred to as the, the Spanish Fury, which takes place in November 76, which involves the plundering of Antwerp and, and, and murder and, and destruction and uh, general horror. Um, the, this then leads to what almost can be seen as the high point in terms of uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, in, in what was going on in the Netherlands, because in, in 76 we get the pacification of Ghent, and in this all the Dutch provinces formed an alliance to help expel the Spanish mercenaries out of their territory. So at that point it looks like everything's paid off. So it, it, that looks that's a good moment for Elizabeth. She she wants the Netherlands to be autonomous. She wants she she wants the, the Spanish and, and the French to be kicked out. So at that point, the um, it, the 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 Dutch are united and fighting the Spanish, and that all looks good. But in 1709, two separate entities in the Netherlands start to merge. Uh, you've got the Union of Utrecht. Uh, which is largely in the northern part of the Netherlands and is uh, Protestant, and the Union of Arras, uh, uh, which is largely southern and Catholic. The Union of Arras expressed loyalty to Philip II and supported his general in, in the Netherlands, the Duke of Parma. Um, and therefore, Parma then can push through and starts to regain lots of the lost land in the Netherlands for Spain. And this means that the idea that the Spanish can use the Netherlands uh, as a launch pad to attack England uh, become stronger. So at this point, we see Elizabeth trying to take more and more drastic action. So at this point, she starts to supporting Anjou in the Netherlands, as we saw, though, that 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 doesn't work. Um, we also see it quite provocatively supporting uh, the Portuguese claimant, uh, Don Antonio, when Philip II inherited the Portuguese crown on top of everything else that he already controlled in 1580. Now, part of that might just be the idea that they want to distract Philip. If Philip is concentrating on Portugal, it means he's not concentrating on the Netherlands and England. So that might just be a kind of distraction technique. Can't look over there, over there. That's where you want to be looking. Don't look over here, look over there. 
And she, Elizabeth starts funding the, the, the Dutch rebels to resist Parma following the failure of Anjou in 81. Um, then we see a, a, a crisis moment for the Dutch and, and for Elizabeth as William of Orange is assassinated by the Spanish in 84. Um, at the same time, the Spanish ambassador Mendoza is being expelled after being implicated in the Throckmorton plot and the Catholic League, the, the French, the Guise family, uh, in, in heavily involved in this, have find the Treaty of Jeanville with Philip. So in 84, everything is in tatters. So the Dutch Protestants are massively weakened. Um, it is very clear that the, the Spanish can be seen very much as an enemy. The hope of balancing them against the French is in tatters because of Jeanville. So Elizabeth, whilst kind of back in 76 with the pacification of Ghent, is probably on a bit of a high. In, in 80, 84, she, she's in a moment of absolute crisis. And then this leads into the Treaty of Nonsuch. Um, signed with the Dutch rebels in 85 and they agree, Elizabeth agrees to send troops and these are going to be headed by her favourite the Earl of Leicester Robert Dudley and they're going to help the rebels resist Parma so unofficially this is actually the the start of the uh, the Spanish English war and, and again you can say that Elizabeth is is playing a very key role in starting that now you can say there has been huge amount of provocation by um, the Spanish but is it kind of six or one half a dozen of the other or, or can you actually lay more blame at Elizabeth's door in 87 um, the, uh, the English successfully uh, attacked Spanish ships at the harbour of Cadiz um, the Earl of Essex it, it, Robert Doverow is involved in this and we, we'll see him um, coming to prominence in, in, in Elizabeth's court but ultimately leading to a rebellion uh, his uh, stepfather, uh, Lester Robert Dudley, proved to be an absolute disaster in the Netherlands. So his men were ill-disciplined, kind of, and this turned the Dutch against them. His commanders quarreled with each other. Even worse, some went over to Parma and kind of handed him some Dutch towns um, that had been taken off them. Uh, and Lester himself quarreled with the Dutch and seemed to be getting too big for his boots. So in 87, he is recalled. And uh, at this point, relations with Spain have completely collapsed. Uh, Mary Queen of Scots is no more, uh, and in 1588 the Spanish Armada sets sail. Now I will look at the details of uh, the Armada and uh, the the war with Spain in, in another video. Is again I think that's a kind of almost a, a separate section. Often the way that essays and things work on this part is, is you you're given 20 years or so before up until 88 and asked why does the war with Spain happen and hopefully the details in uh, in this video will help you uh, answer that question going through giving, giving you all the key events and understanding what Elizabeth was, was trying to do and then giving you an opportunity to build in your own judgments and arguments in terms of well how good a job is she doing at all these different points think about consistency how does policy change over time and and think about how much option how much choices she's got to do it anything differently could it have been done better is it would that have been possible so i hope it's been helpful for you if it has been please hit the the like if you have any questions or comments please leave those be below if you haven't done so already then please do subscribe so this video is part of my collection on uh tudor england going through all the way through henry the seventh henry the eighth edward uh, mary and into elizabeth there are also um playlists on various other bits of history so on Tsarist and communist Russia on the American Civil War on uh, the American uh, the American dreams so or America uh, 45 through to, um, to some 1945 through to 1980 there's videos on that um, and then there's also there's uh, modern Britain and loads and loads of stuff on British and American politics as well so loads on the channel that you might be helpful for you particularly if you are an A-level history and or an A-level politics student but also if you're just interested in history and politics hopefully plenty there for you as well thank you very much for watching